வணக்கம் எஸ் த ப்ராசஸ் ஆஃப் டெசிஷன் மேக்கிங் இன் ஏ பேஷண்ட் வித் ரேடியல் நர்வ் பால்சி இஸ் குவைட் அலாபரேட் பட் வி நீட் டு நோ த டீடெயில்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஈச் ஆப்ஷன் பிஃபோர் டிசைடிங் விச் இஸ் பெஸ்ட் ஃபார் த பேஷண்ட் ஹோப்ஃபுல்லி த வீடியோ ஆன் த ப்ராசஸ் ஆஃப் டெசிஷன் மேக்கிங் வுட் ஹவ் ஹெல்ப்ட் ஹேவிங் லேர்ன் த டீடெயில்ஸ் வி ஷெல் நவ் சி த ஷார்ட் கட்ஸ் தட் ஆர் அவைலபிள் ஆர் த சிம்பிளர் டெசிஷன் மேக்கிங் ப்ராசஸ் இன் டூ வேஸ் first an algorithm of management for the three common types of injury radial nerve palsy in closed and open injuries radial nerve palsy associated with fracture of the humerus and involvement of the posterior interosseous nerve in entrapment syndromes and to make it easier still we shall see a scenario by scenario protocol of management considering the common scenarios that we are likely to see in clinical practice involving radial nerve palsy First we shall consider the simplified algorithm of management of radial nerve palsy in closed and open injuries the injury to the radial nerve could present with a closed injury or an open injury if it is a closed injury first we need to assess the patient and observe for 3 weeks at the end of 3 weeks we can do an ultrasound to look for any injury to the nerve on ultrasound we could get any of these findings there may be nothing abnormal or the nerve may be intact but contused or thirdly the nerve may be entrapped in an associated fracture of the humerus if there is nothing abnormal detected on ultrasound or it appears intact only contused we need to wait for the calculated period for the growth of the nerve and reinnervation of the proximal most muscle on the other hand if it is an open injury with a radial nerve palsy we definitely need to go in for an exploratory procedure on exploration we may find that the nerve may be intact but only contused entrapped in an associated fracture or completely severe if it is intact but contused we only need to wait for a calculated period but if it is entrapped we need to extricate it from the fracture site or the point where it is entrapped if it is completely severe we need to do either a repair or if there is a gap between the cut ends we need to put in a graft sometimes the repair may not be possible like in cases of associated skin loss extensive soft tissue injuries or the viability of the ends of the nerve may not be accessible once the surgery of extrication repair or nerve grafting has been done we need to wait for the calculated period and in the meantime we need to put the patient on electrical stimulation or dynamic splinting on the other hand if repair is not possible we need to plan for a staged reconstruction we reconstruct the other soft tissues and then go for a tendon transfer straight away in the meantime having waited for the calculated period of time for recovery of the most proximal muscle innervated by the nerve there could be an improvement or there could be no evidence of improvement either clinically or electrophysiologically we need to remember here that this calculated period is not absolute it could be delayed in elderly individuals or if there is a lot of scarring associated with the injury or other conditions in which case the decision has to be made on exact clinical assessment of the patient so what do we do now if it has improved we only need to give the patient resisted exercises to improve the strength of the muscles if it has not improved we need to consider the time factor this is not only for the patients for whom we are waiting after surgery or conservative management it is also considered for patients who are presenting late after the injury or after surgery done elsewhere it could be less than 6 months from the time of injury or from the time of surgery or more than 6 months generally we consider 6 months as the period for evaluation as it is the average time for the injury of the radial nerve in the level of the arm to recover if it is less than 6 months from instituting non operative management of a case of radial nerve palsy we can plan for an exploration of the nerve and nerve surgery because we can still get good results but in situations where the exploration and nerve surgery are being done close to 6 months after 
of injury, a concomitant tendon transfer or distal nerve transfer would also help. If six months have elapsed since the nerve surgery has been done and recovery has not been seen, it is ideal to do a formal tendon transfer or in some conditions a nerve transfer. If on the other hand, more than six months have elapsed, it may not be ideal to do a nerve procedure like a grafting or a repair, but it, it would give better results if a tendon transfer is done straight away. If the patient is younger, a distal nerve transfer can also be done to get better results. As I have already mentioned, the value of six months is not absolute. Every patient should be considered individually and the conditions must be assessed clinically before a plan can be made. Now let us see the algorithm of management for a radial nerve palsy associated with the fracture of the humerus. According to the orthopedic principles of management, this fracture of the humerus may require internal fixation or may not require internal fixation. If it does require internal fixation, the planned fixation could be either intramedullary fixation or external fixation or open reduction and internal fixation with appropriate plate and screws. If intramedullary fixation or external fixation is planned, usually there is no access for nerve exploration. It needs to be managed as a conservative management as discussed earlier. However, if possible, it would be good to do a nerve exploration also along with this procedure. If on the other hand, open reduction and plate and screw fixation is being done, nerve exploration and concomitant repair or reconstruction as required and if necessary internal splinting can be done according to the principles elucidated in the video on decision making process. Even if the nerve is not injured, care must be taken during the procedure to protect the nerve adequately. Whatever the procedure that has been done, it must be followed up with observation, adequate splints and therapy and electrical stimulation. If the fracture does not require internal fixation, external support is given and must be followed up with observation, splints therapy and electrical stimulation. After this, a nerve conduction study needs to be done after 6 weeks, again after 3 months and at 6 months to look for improvement. If it is improved, we need to give resisted exercises to improve the strength of the muscle. If it has not improved, even at the end of 6 months, we need to plan for a tendon transfer. Let us now consider the management protocol for a posterior interosseous nerve palsy caused by entrapment neuropathy. This spontaneous posterior interosseous nerve palsy could be due to compressive etiology or non-compressive etiology. The symptoms due to compressive neuropathy could be mild, moderate or severe according to the Ochi, Wu and Hirachi classification systems. If the symptoms are mild or moderate, a decompression neurolysis needs to be done. If the symptoms are severe, exploration and nerve reconstruction needs to be done and a tendon transfer can be planned if the duration of the compression has been more than 9 months. On the other hand, if it has been a non-compressive cause of the entrapment like a vasculitis or neurogenic causes, non-operative management needs to be instituted. The first scenario, patient presenting with an injury on the arm with a laceration along with a radial nerve palsy. There is no fracture associated. As in this patient who has had an assault injury on the right arm, he needs an exploration and primary repair of the nerve if needed. If there is a gap, he needs a nerve grafting. Usually in this sort of assault injury, there will be a cut of the nerve and when explode immediately, primary neurography can be done. There is usually no need for a tendon transfer or internal splinting. But in taking a decision, we also need to consider the age of the patient, the healing that is going to occur and what the patient actually wants and what his occupation is. The second scenario is patient presenting with an injury on the arm with a laceration and having a radial nerve palsy and on exploration, it is found that there is a loss of segment of the nerve. The same plan of exploration should be done and primary nerve grafting should be performed usually using the sural nerve. There is again no need for an internal splinting or a tendon transfer in such patients as the results are good. But even though we are planning for an exploration and primary nerve grafting, we also need to consider the age of the patient 
and what the patient wants. For instance, if the patient is going to be an elderly gentleman, we can think of doing an internal splinting or a tendon transfer. The next scenario is that of a patient with an injury on the arm with a laceration and only skin suturing had been done elsewhere and patient is presenting after a period of time, for instance say after 6 months. As in the case of this young girl who had sustained an injury in a road traffic accident and has had the radial nerve palsy for 6 months. In this situation, it is important to investigate with the help of nerve conduction studies and ultrasound to find out the status of the injured nerve. The next step would be to explore and do either a primary repair or grafting according to the finding on exploration. Since it is 6 months following injury, we need to consider primary tendon transfer or distal nerve transfers as applicable. But we need to remember that we should also consider the age as with the other conditions and we also consider the status of the scar. If it is indurated, a period of ultrasound scar massage will make it more soft and supple and the underlying tissues will be more vascular and support the growth of the nerve repair or grafting that is going to be done. The fourth scenario is a less common scenario of injury on the arm with skin loss and obviously there will be a loss of a segment of the radial nerve with palsy. As in this patient who has had an electrical burn on the arm with the loss of skin, soft tissues, muscles and a segment of the radial nerve. When faced with such a situation, we need to plan for a staged reconstruction. The first step should be to reconstruct the skin with a flap cover. The second step would consist of nerve exploration and grafting or repair either together or in a different stage. We also need to remember that in such a situation the healing of the nerve graft may not be optimal and hence a primary tendon transfer needs to be done along with the nerve surgery. As in other conditions we also need to consider the age of the patient, the status of the scar and skin. Since it is being done in a staged manner, we also need to consider the status of the joints and unless the joints are soft and supple in the hand, the stage of reconstruction of the nerve should be deferred. The next scenario is when the patient has a blunt injury on the arm with a simple fracture of the humerus and has been managed with a POP by the orthopedic surgical team and no fixation has been planned and the patient has presented with a radial nerve palsy which has been noted to be present from the time of injury. In such a situation, the first thing we need to find out whether the nerve is injured or not. An ultrasound definitely would help in this situation. We can wait for 6 months for evidence of the first muscles to recover that is the extensa carpi radialis longus and the brachioradialis. If they do not show clinical signs of recovery by 6 months, Investigations like the nerve conduction studies would definitely help. If even then there is no recovery, we need to explore and do a nerve surgery in younger individuals and a tendon transfer is ideal in such situations because there has already been a delay of 6 months. After considering the age of the patient, since the patient is going to be put on conservative management, we also need to consider the attitude of the patient and what his needs are in the time of waiting in terms of occupation. We also need to consider the status of the scar and the skin and edema in duration must be taken care of. Next, we come to a very common scenario, a blunt injury on the arm with fracture humerus fixed with plate and screws by the orthopedic surgical team with the presence of radial nerve palsy either noted from the time of injury or after the surgical procedure of fixation of the fracture. First, if possible, we need to find out if the palsy was present before the surgery. Usually, the patients may not be able to note this deficit because of the bigger problem of fracture of the humerus and the pain that is associated with it. If possible, we could discuss this issue with the orthopedic colleagues who have done the fixation so they can give us an idea about the nature of the injury and the status of the nerve during the surgery. If such information is not available and we are not able to discuss with the orthopedic surgeons, investigations like ultrasound can help to determine whether there is a transection or entrapment of the nerve. In which case, primary neurography in the form of repair or grafting is required, 
but there is no need for a tendon transfer in such patients as the result of neurorephy is quite good. Again, we need to consider the age of the patient, the attitude of the patient and what he feels he should be able to do in the waiting period and the status of the scar through which the orthopedic surgical team has fixed the fracture and the status of the joints. This scenario is also a commonly seen clinical scenario when the patient presents after sleeping in an intoxicated state with inability to extend the wrist and fingers. A similar kind of presentation could also come with a crutch palsy where it is more prolonged or with honeymoon palsy. Since the etiology of injury of the radial nerve is very obvious and it is only neuropraxia that has caused the problem, conservative methods of treatment, physiotherapy and dynamic splint application is the prescribed method of treatment. There is no need for surgical intervention in such patients in most of the cases. However, during the waiting period for recovery of the nerve, patient compliance must be obtained to get good results. Another scenario is when a patient has sustained an injury on the arm with a fractured humerus and fixed with plate and screws by the orthopedic surgical team, but the patient has presented after nearly two years due to various reasons and he still has a radial nerve palsy. Since the nerve has not recovered over the period of two years, it is obvious that the nerve had been transected and any further surgery to the nerve like nerve grafting will not help. So a classical tendon transfer needs to be done for such patients to ensure good extension of the wrist, fingers and thumb. Again, although it's only a classical tendon transfer that is going to be done, we need to assess the age of the patient and the attitude of the patient and why he had defaulted treatment for so long and the status of the skin or scar and the status of the joints must be assessed. The final scenario of the patient who may present with a radial nerve palsy or lack of extension of the wrist, fingers and thumb is a patient who has sustained an extensive injury on the forearm following side sweep injury with aversion of the muscles and skin loss. Such patients will require skin reconstruction if they present in the acute stage or if they present after the skin reconstruction has been done, they need a tendon transfer. Considering a patient who has been through multiple procedures, we need to assess the status of the scar or skin and the status of the joints. I hope you enjoyed the video. I enjoyed making it. Kindly click on the shown links to see more about the basics of decision making in the radial nerve and the details of each option available. And do not forget to subscribe to keep connected with the latest in learning hand surgery.